So to prevent us from having to tear all this out every single time to reuse it, we just tape it off. Um, this, this house has been flooded probably 45 times at this point um, and smoked out probably about 10 times at this point. Um, everything in here except for the baseboards are original from when we first started doing this about four years ago. Um, so the techniques that we use allow us to save a lot of the materials, which is great for insurance companies and homeowners, right? Insurance companies, it's going to save them a lot of dollars, especially on the rebuild end. But homeowners, if we're not having to pull stuff out and replace it and we can just clean it, we can usually get them into their property again a lot faster than if we were to tear it out, wait for new material to come in and put it back together, right? So that's where the specialty equipment comes into play. Um, one thing that we use on a regular basis are these here. These used to be called chem sponges. Um, people didn't like the name chem sponges because they thought there was chemicals in these, which there's not. So now these are called dry sponges. So I'll hand some of these out. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you can feel them. So now the last class that was in here on Tuesday already started wiping down some walls, so you might see some streak marks already happening. Um, but if you want to just take a second, when you wipe the wall, you'll notice on the clean side of it, if you use the clean side of it and you wipe, you'll get a transfer of material on that. It'll start to turn black. So when we're doing smoke and odor damage, when we're cleaning walls, there's a three-part process to it. I know, right? right. <laughs> Labor. Yeah. Right? <laughs> this is the first process. The first process is wiping wow. down any of the big debris that's stuck to the walls. So we'll have guys in the job site with these chem sponges or dry sponges wiping down walls. Now you wipe down the wall until you get no more transfer of soot on the dry sponge. So if you can imagine how long they're sitting there wiping, right? So that's the first step is wiping down with the, with the dry sponge. The second the second step is coming back through with a wet chemical treatment. Um, so it's a, it's a bucket with chemicals in it and hot soapy water and a wet rag. And so when you're using the, the chem sponges, you're wiping top to bottom because you want to knock debris down. Well, when you're wiping with a wet wipe, you're wiping from bottom to top. The reason you do that is because if you start top to bottom and that water starts to run, you're going to leave streaks. And once those streaks start happening, you're not going to get them out. So you wipe clean up. So that way everything you're moving up to is clean. Um, and then the last step is a HEPA vacuum. So then we come back through and we HEPA vacuum everything up. I've got a HEPA vacuum out there, so I'll show you what it looks like. Um, so the idea is to get everything knocked down to the ground and then vacuum it all up. But Sorry, I missed that. Can you repeat that? So when, you, when you're wiping, you start from the bottom and then work yourself up? So you use the dry sponge first to go top to bottom. That's going to knock all the big debris and particles off and onto the ground. And then when you're wiping with a wet rag, you're wiping top to bottom. Because as you're going up, you're, everything below you is now clean. So it shouldn't streak on you. Where if you wipe top to bottom, it's going to streak through all that dirty material. And once you get streaks in it, it's really hard to get those streaks out. And so that's the process with the IICRC. Now, a lot of times when you wipe down and clean walls, if you do it correctly and the damage isn't too bad, you can, you can get it clean without having to do any painting or any of that. Now, if it gets bad enough and it's discoloration, which I have some pictures that I'll show you, then obviously there's two things that may happen. One, we either may cut it out because it's damaged beyond repair, or two, you'll go over it with a really heavy primer. Today's primers are very, very good. Um, and then you go over it with usually two coats of paint on top of that to seal everything in. <coughs> now, the big issue you run into is when you have openings and walls, you start getting inside the wall cavity, and then that can't be cleaned. That drywall has to be pulled off in order to get behind this wall to clean behind the wall. So depending on how invasive that smoke was when it traveled through the home will really determine your practical approach on handling the job, right? So this is one way of doing it, but if we come into it and we determine that it's gotten inside the walls, well then the practical approach at that point would be to just demo it and start over. What, what do you do when you get up in the, the attic and there's no, I mean, you get up through the, through the attic and everything? Yeah, so, so, how do you usually, that or do you so a couple things happen when you start getting into attics. As long as the trusses are in good shape, which we'll usually pull in an engineering report to determine the structural of the place, um, but as long as the trusses are good, then we'll usually go in there. We'll rip out all of 
the blown in insulation. We'll wipe down, vacuum, HEPA vacuum all of the walls, even the OSB that's on the top side, and then we'll come back through with a, with a real heavy primer. Um, so almost like it okay. kills product. Um, oh, so you're just sealing everything in? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now if there's damage beyond repair, then we have to start pulling roofs and start pulling trusses and beams and stuff like that, which house fires typically go upwards, and so usually roofs are one of the things that usually don't get salvaged. Those are usually replaced. So, so you got like, so you have like rafters. Do so you got to pull like permits to like cut certain rafters? Yeah, out? you've got to get an engineering report, which we usually call these guys here. They'll pull pull an engineering report. And they'll tell us what trusses are salvageable, which trusses are not, and then we'll go through and we'll pull off. We'll obviously our our permitted our our because we're we're general contractors as well. So we pull permits, pull the rafters that are damaged off. Put the new rafters in, new OSB, new shingles, and put a new roof on it. Right. How do you manage the HVAC system? Uh, it gets cleaned. It just gets cleaned? Yeah. Is it um, similar kind of process? Uh, do you... So HVAC is, it, because it's aluminum, mm -hmm. it's non-organic material. So a lot of times you can go through there and clean that stuff out significantly easier than porous material like drywall. Okay. Are these sponges available to the public? Yeah. Yeah, they sell them at Lowe's and Home Depot and stuff like that. Okay. How do you so, wash them? You don't. You wipe them until they're done and then you throw them away. Yep, yep. I'll take some of those. You don't have to keep holding them. <laughs> Everyone's looking at them like, I'm getting dirty. <laughs> <laughs> just throw them on the table here. So, yeah, it's definitely it's, it's a unique process when dealing with this. But the big issue when you're dealing with stuff that's on walls is that smoke and soot will get behind there. And so in order to get that area cleaned, you've got to pull it off. So we've been to other jobs that we've taken over from other companies where they thought everything was done. Well, months later, these people have a lingering smell and can't figure out where that smell is. And then we start investigating to see what was done, what wasn't done. A lot of times cabinets and stuff weren't pulled because the adjuster told them that they didn't need to do it. And so they just trusted their adjuster and decided not to pull it. Well, if you're trained, you fight for the customer and not the adjuster. So it's like, hey, Unless you can prove to me that there's no smoke damage behind there, which the only way you can prove it is by pulling it off, then we're going to pull it off to inspect. And so cabinets will usually come out so we can get behind there. So if you wipe the walls and then like the insulation, like, usually the insulation is not soluble, right? Like, uh, insulation is usually only on exterior walls. Um, usually the interior walls of the house, like this wall behind us here, um, is not insulated unless you paid extra when the house is being built to have it insulated. Um, but most of the time it's just exterior walls that have insulation in them. Um, a lot of times these walls, the way they're built is you have a base plate, a two by four that runs along the bottom and along the top. So usually that smoke doesn't get down into those cavities unless you have electrical coming through it or plumbing or something like that coming through it because it's usually sealed in there pretty good. And so it's really hard to know until you start investigating. So some walls we may open up where the damage is the most to see what it looks like behind there. Sometimes we can crawl up into the attic space and kind of look through and see which, which walls have holes in it for electrical. Sometimes you can go down into basements and look up from underneath and kind of get a good idea of what's going on. But a lot of times these cavities are pretty closed in. They're usually sealed off pretty well to where unless that fire has burned through walls and has gone through different rooms, it's usually not going to affect the cavities too bad. The big thing you deal with cavities though is when you have fire, you have a fire department that comes in and does what? Water. Douses the house with water, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of these damaged houses, unless it's the top level that was unaffected that just got smoke damage, a lot of these houses, you're dealing with more water damage than you are smoke damage and fire damage. And usually when you get into fire damage or houses or commercial buildings that are on fire, usually that job has been sitting waiting for an adjuster to come out to inspect it before anything gets started on it. And anyone know how long it takes for mold to start growing in a property? 24 hours. 40, 24 to 48 hours, yep. So given the right circumstances and the right environment, you can start getting mold growing within 24 to 48 hours. When you start getting mold growing on something porous, you have to pull it. There's no just saving it, you have to pull it. So we'll take it down to the framing um, once we get it down to the framing, we'll usually treat with an antimicrobial. We'll do a light sanding, a HEPA vacuuming, and then an encapsulation on the structure. And by encapsulating it, that's going to keep all of that smell and stuff sealed in. So it's not going to come out to the rest of the house. Make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, stuff like furniture, carpet, stuff like that. Carpet usually gets pulled. Pad usually gets pulled. Usually that soot gets into the material and you can't save it. 
Some of the furniture can be salvageable, depending on the type of material that the furniture is, um, and then depending on how deep that, that has penetrated in, which my contents guy will talk more about that in a little bit. So, any questions so far about any of this? Okay, I know it gets a little warm in here, so we can head back out and we'll kind of talk about some of the equipment that